Hello and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's first ever Facebook Live presentation as we try to bring you a little bit more of Riverwood at home as we all do our part to stay home amidst the spread of COVID-19. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rashid Clark. I'm the Marketing Specialist at the Riverwood Conservancy and joined here with uh, Dave Taylor, our program, our education program director and a wildlife photographer and author who's going to be talking more today about wildlife in Mississauga and the greater Toronto area. So thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, just a heads up as we go through the presentation, please type in your questions into the comments section down below this broadcast and we'll get to as many of your questions today as we can. And again, thanks so much for being with us today. If you have the financial ability to give us a donation as we struggle with uh, the challenges of COVID-19, of course, we would very much appreciate that. And you can make a donation at the riverwoodconservancy.org. Uh, coming up next week, we would have had our largest fundraiser of the year, the Riverwood Garden Soiree. Of course, that's not happening because of the COVID-19 restrictions in place. So right now we are, uh, a little bit uh, short, uh, shall we say, uh, from our budget goals for 2019. So again, if you have the financial capabilities, of course, we would very much appreciate a donation at the riverwoodconservancy.org. Uh, that's enough for me now. I will turn things over to Dave Taylor, who is a wildlife photographer and the author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology. And he's produced educational videos and material about wildlife for school curriculums. He's taught science and geography for over 30 years and nature photography and writing for over 25 years. So clearly a wildlife expert. And uh, again, he's currently the education program director for the Riverwood Conservancy. So I'll turn things over to Dave. And as we go through the presentations, again, please uh, drop your questions into the comments section and we'll get to as many of those as we can. So Dave, over to you. Thanks Rasheed. And welcome to anybody that's out there. Um, we're going to talk about wildlife in Mississauga and the GTA. And as a wildlife photographer, I've traveled to Africa and Europe, South America and the States looking for subjects. But one of the things I've learned is there's an awful lot right here in my own backyard, literally in my own backyard. Uh, just last week, I was photographing hummingbirds and cardinals and Baltimore Orioles. There's been cottontail rabbits around. We've had a skunk around, an opossum, and that's without leaving home. And uh, this uh, situation we're in with COVID has opened up a lot of people's eyes to the wildlife around them. And so we thought we'd do this talk and, and let you know what's out there and maybe answer some of your questions. Um, Mississauga is home to probably well over 250 species of nesting birds. We have many more species flying through. Riverwood alone has 186 species of birds, a little over a dozen species of mammals, ranging from very small mammals like the shrew right up to the white-tailed deer. But if you expand that into the GTA and down include the lakeshore, then you get into areas where you've got uh, all sorts of waterfowl, uh, shorebirds that don't necessarily show up at Riverwood. And then there are other mammals as well. Uh, black bear are being seen more and more consistently on the fringes of the GTA. Not in Mississauga, unfortunately, or maybe from your point of view, fortunately. <clears throat> but there was one seen in uh, Markham yesterday or on the weekend. There have been some seen crossing the 407. And there's certainly black bear out along the escarpment. So we have a, a range of wildlife. Not everything that was here when the pioneers arrived, but a substantial number. And we've had new arrivals like opossums that have only arrived within the last 30, 40 years. Coyotes are relatively new. So this is a constantly changing and dynamic place. This is the best time of the year to see birds because they're migrating through. We have a lot of um, warblers coming through. There's a lot of songbirds coming through. You may have noticed a few weeks ago, large flocks of robins. In the marshes, you can hear uh, the American toads trilling. They're very loud, almost deafening. You might be enough, lucky enough to hear some frogs croaking. So there's a lot going around. And so I invite you to send some questions in. Part of this talk is to talk a little bit about concepts that students are learning about in their science programs. 
Uh, maybe it's ecology, maybe it's just what an animal is, um, where they might be seen, how they might behave, their habitats. Riverwood is rich in some habitats and absent others. We obviously don't have a lake or a waterfall, but we have woods and we have some grasslands and meadows. Uh, different animals will be found in those things. If you move, move further up into larger meadowed areas, you might find birds like bobolinks, which we don't see at Riverwood. Um, further out, you might find sandhill cranes uh, with their chicks in the farmer's fields. The GTA encompasses a large variety of habitats and a large number of species, more than you would expect. Um, one of the things we'll look at is diversity. Diversity is this concept where the more of you, different things you have, the healthier the environment is. The more an ecosystem is limited in its plants, for instance, the more it limits the number of species. Uh, the converse is the more it limits the number of species, the more of a particular species we can have. When I was a teacher, I used to work on the Britannia School Farm for a couple of years. And we were able to make the analogy between a farm and the African plains. And they're very similar. For instance, cattle would be the same as, say, buffalo in uh, North America or wildebeest out in Africa. Goats and sheep eat the smallest part of the grasses and graze quite low and can really damage the environment. But they were the equivalent of small gazelles in Africa. Donkeys and horses would be the equivalent of, of course, zebras. And each of those food animals, each of those animals ate different parts of the farm or the African plain. So um, if you take a look at a gazelle, small animal, nibbles right down the very bottom of the grass. Sheep and goats do the same thing. They don't compete with cattle or wildebeest because they are large munchers. They have big, wide mouths. They take up a lot of food. They need a lot of grasses. And they need a lot of good grass. Whereas the horses and the donkeys and the zebras, they can get along pretty well on rough, rough grass, grass that is not nearly as good. So you can look at farm as an analogy of, of different habitats. If you go to a rainforest, the diversity of species is way beyond what you would find on a, a grassland or a farm, but there are not as many. So you don't find herds of anything in rainforests. You might find small groups, say 50 or 60 monkeys feeding on a good tree, but that tree with all that ripe fruit might be isolated and there might not be another tree for miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers. So rainforests, while they are more diverse, have fewer numbers of animals of one type. Riverwood and the GTA is kind of in the temperate uh, forest, mixed temperate forest. So we have maples and we have some spruce trees and we have some pines and we have some uh, beech trees and we have lots of grassland. So we have a pretty high diversity. We have lots of animals, white-tailed deer, are really an animal that thrives on having a variety of habitats. They like to feed in open fields, but go into the forest for safety. Um, some animals like groundhogs prefer open fields. Squirrels prefer the forest. Red squirrels prefer pine forests. So wherever you go, you find the diversity of wildlife fits the community of the habitat, what's in that habitat and the plant growth. And that's an important concept for kids to understand. It's an important concept for us to understand too, because as we look at climate change, and it, we should all be considering it, climate change is coming along with, uh, it's changing our diversity, changing the world we live in. If you're a species like a white-tailed deer that can adapt to change quickly, climate change doesn't hold the threat. They can, white-tailed deer can live in the northern forest. They can live in the southern swamps. 
Some animals like cottontail rabbits can't handle that change. It might surprise you to know that there were no cottontail rabbits in Southern Ontario, none in the 1800s, and probably hadn't been there for a few hundred years. But we know a thousand years ago, there were cottontail rabbits living in the province of what would become Ontario. But then we entered a place, phase called the Little Ice Age and the climate cooled off, particularly in Eastern Canada. And the cottontail rabbits disappeared from here and moved south down into the Carolinian forests of South Carolina, North Carolina. And as the climate gradually warmed up, the cottontail rabbits started to come back. So climate change is going to change our diversity. There's no question. There will be new birds that we'll see. There'll be birds that we won't see any longer. So we're looking at a concept that's important to us too, because we have to adapt. We've been adapting very nicely to the COVID-19 crisis, and we'll have to adapt to climate change. Climate change will take a bit longer to work its way through than COVID, we hope. We hope that there'll be more time. And on that note, Rashid, why don't we start with some questions? Very good idea. So we will, uh, again, have questions. We'll have to answer as many questions as we can today. And if you have any, please drop them into the comments section just below the live stream here. Uh, first one that we have comes from uh, Suzanne, uh, who is hearing a baby raccoon screeching a few houses over from hers. Uh, went outside and saw adult raccoon on neighbor's roof. Then he, she went down the chimney. Oh, no. Uh, will he or she get out on her own? Uh, Suzanne, I, I hope for everybody's sake the uh, raccoon can get out. Professional uh, wildlife handlers um, will try and set traps, and the traps are such that they have to make sure they get all the babies out. Um, raccoons that get into uh, chimneys can be really, really devastating. They can do a lot of damage. Uh, I've seen houses where they put a hole, you know, that big in the roof to get out when they panic. Um, I don't know what to tell you about the baby screeching. The mother is probably beside herself trying to get the baby out. But I know that professional people that come in to remove pests, they have a way of uh, trapping the babies and the parents to make sure that there's none left in there. And you certainly don't want one of the animals to starve to death because um, having had that happen, I can assure you it is not a pleasant uh, experience. Uh, and if it gets really serious, you might have to, the people might have to take the chimney down. Uh, interestingly enough, Toronto has one of the highest numbers of raccoons anywhere in the world. It is only succeeded, exceeded by Hamburg, Germany, apparently. Somebody decided to increase the diversity in Germany by bringing in raccoons. Bad idea. The raccoons are found everywhere in that town. And this sort of problem that you're alluding to, boy, <laughs> yeah, it's all over the place in Germany. It's bad enough in Toronto and Mississauga. And if you do decide to capture a raccoon and release it, take it a good distance away, um, several kilometers. And remember, too, that when you release it, you are releasing it into habitat that there are already raccoons living there. So that raccoon is going to have a tough goal of it. If you release it, uh, like if you were to take it from where I live over to Riverwood, which is about a kilometer and a half away, that raccoon would probably be home in my neck of the woods before I got home. So uh, best, best advice, call a uh, pet control person and get them to look after it. Next question. Next question. Uh, which will uh, actually came in to us a little bit uh, ahead of the live broadcast. Uh, so someone who was uh, walking their dog and three coyotes came out and seemed to be inviting the dog to play. Uh, should I be concerned and what was happening? <laughs> yeah, uh, you should be concerned. Um, the dog in this case, I, my understanding was, was off leash. This particular coyote I photographed at Riverwood and it was barking at me and putting on a really interesting show because in walking along the trail, I got too close to the den. Now, I never saw the den, 
But this coyote, which I believe was male, came out and put on a show and escorted me away from the den. He would show himself and obviously I was going to take his picture. So he was distracting me and attracting me to go away with him. Uh, we've seen this a couple of times at Riverwood where the coyotes that come out. Coyotes and dogs are natural enemies. The dog is a type of wolf. You know, it's basically a domesticated wolf. A coyote is a smaller wolf. In the wild, I've seen gray wolves attack and kill coyotes. I've seen coyotes attack and kill red foxes. So your dog fits someplace in that, that chain. And these, this person with his dog, he attracted the attention of three coyotes. Obviously, their intent was to get the dog away from the den. Um, the interesting fact was there were three coyotes. That tells me that there were two adults, mother and father, who probably had puppies in the den. And the third one typically is a daughter from last year who has found it advantageous to stick with her parents and hang around and help mom and dad out. And then next year, once these puppies are raised, she will go off, find her own mate and have her own. Now she gets an advantage because she gets to stay in mom and dad's territory, which is probably richer than territories that might be upwards to hundred kilometers away. So she gets a bit of an advantage from doing this. The puppies get more food because she brings it in. But that dog walker had stumbled into a situation where if the dog had run off, the coyotes might really have turned on them. And although coyotes might be smaller than the dog in question, they are a lot more efficient at fighting. Um, so you don't want to do that. Keep your dog on a leash. This particular dog, because I know the owner, um, was a very well-trained dog and did not go after the coyotes, even though it was tempted. So a bit of advice, uh, any place in Mississauga, there are coyotes. They are an unnatural and important part of the diversity we have here. You shouldn't be afraid of them, but you should not uh, encourage them to come around you. Um, just, I, I suggest to dog walkers, they may want to carry a stick. Probably they'll use it against other dogs that come and attack their own dogs. But it's always good to have some protection from coyotes. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, yeah, we are. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed more coyotes roaming around now that uh, people tend to be staying indoors more as a result of the COVID lockdown. Um, do you think there's uh, been I guess, more brazen acts of uh, coyotes walking around now that they aren't seeing as many humans uh, in their day-to-day -day life? I think the coyotes that are here um, have adapted very well to living with people. They've been living here probably 30, 40 years and there's multi-generations. They've done a study in Los Angeles and in Chicago. And when the coyotes first arrived, there was a high attrition. There were a lot of coyotes being killed on the road. Coyotes were uh, just not very bright about how to get around people. They've seen that attrition, which was like 60% of the pups drop down to maybe 20 or 30% over the years because the coyotes have adapted well. And the other thing you gotta remember is these coyotes that have lived with us know how to behave with us. They tend not to be too aggressive. They tend not to be you know, stealing puppies off of people's back porches or eating their cats. Although if that does happen, the coyotes are a little bit more well-behaved if we were to come in and trap the coyotes out, what we would get is an influx of coyotes from outside the GTA coming in. And those coyotes would not be as adaptable and as knowledgeable to our environment. So we would have more problems. So living with the animals, whether it's deer, coyote, squirrels that are used to us, makes more sense than getting rid of them. And in some ways, the coyote is protecting us against other things. They they keep animals that might bring fleas and ticks into our backyards away. So they help us in many ways. And they keep the deer numbers down. They're a natural uh, predation that happens on our deer herds, which keeps the deers 
they're it's relatively balanced. So they're an important part of living here, but they they can be a threat. And they are getting bolder. And there are some places where people feed them. They shouldn't. And there are some places where coyotes will be out in the day. That is rare during the spring, summer, fall, early winter. It's much more common to see a coyote during the day in the, say, February, March, especially after cold snap because uh, the cold has frozen over the, their prey, which is mainly metal voles, are no longer reproducing. There's less prey. Coyotes are more desperate. They go out and they start to look for food, and that's why we see them more often then. But yeah, there, there, there are a few coyotes I'm sure that you might see wandering around during the day. Yep. Okay, so you mentioned, uh, you know, like not feeding or, you know, the kind of behaviors that humans can do as we talk about maintaining good uh, diversity in the in the wildlife around us. And that uh, plays nicely into this question that we had uh, from Cindy, uh, which is what can we do and what should we not do as individuals to help maintain this healthy diversity of wildlife around us? Good question, Cindy. Um, there's a lot you can do. Uh, feeding birds is a really good thing to do because it keeps the birds here. They're under a lot of pressure with, uh, particularly well, during their southern part of the migration. Uh, feeding them is a good thing, whether it's cardinals or uh, sparrows or chickadees or whatever you have around. The other thing you do is plant plants that, uh, you know, birds like and pollinators like and insects like. So you might want to create a pollinator garden, a garden where you invite bees and other insects in. Hummingbirds love it. Um, planting trees is always a good thing. Um, the, there are more trees in Mississauga now than there were 100 years ago. It's unbelievable, but it's true because we're no longer a farming community. So we have planted trees on the roadways. We protected woodlots. We have planted trees in our backyards. So that's something you can do. The other thing that you can do to protect diversity is to take part in webinars like this. Uh, let politicians know that you're interested in wildlife. Use the parks and let people know that you value the parks, whether it's sending an email or posting your pictures online, sharing a story, getting the family out. Um, these sorts of things resonate with politicians. So Mississauga has got a fairly extensive plan to do more parks along the Credit River um, and take out things like uh, baseball diamonds and soccer pitches that are in the River Valley and convert the River Valley back into a natural corridor. By supporting that sort of thing, uh, that makes a real difference. So in your backyard, be back, be animal friendly. Don't use a lot of poisons. Uh, think about what you put on your lawn, what you put in the driveway, when you wash your car. Uh, think about planting more trees. Think about planting flowers that attract insects. Think about feeding birds. On a bigger scale, engage yourself in some tourism. Go someplace to see wildlife. You know that bird watching is the number one, I don't think it's a sport quite, but the number one activity, it has surpassed golf. And bird watching is something people are doing everywhere. And if you can get out and do some bird watching, we have a couple of uh, excellent uh, bird watching leaders that do walks for us and the amount of species they see. And people come out and by coming out and enjoying that walk, you're sending a message to the conservation areas and to the city that this is important to you. So do a little bit of traveling, do a little tourism. If you can afford it, go to Africa and support, you know, saying I like African wildlife. Uh, I support uh, an initiative out in the prairie to return the bison back to a prairie and, and create a, a huge prairie ecosystem that will run from Texas to Canada. Um, doing that kind of thing, uh, spending a bit of money here and there, uh, buy books, um, books on nature, you know, anything you can do like that will help get the message across to the public that this is a value to you. 
And that uh, leads us nicely, we'll speaking of birds, into uh, our next question, which comes from Aaron, uh, who says, hey, Dave, have you seen any interesting birds so far this spring? Um, if you mean unusual, uh, not really. Uh, some of my friends have been posting some beautiful pictures of the warblers have come through. I've been working, <laughs> fortunately, on doing education programs, which has involved me doing a lot of work at the computer, putting together videos and, and programs for teachers. But I have gotten out a little bit. I've been photographing a hummingbird, as I said, in the backyard, which are beautiful. Um, I'm hoping to get out and get down to the lake shore and, and walk along there when the parks open up. Always hoping to see a bald eagle or two. Um, there's, I haven't seen anything really unusual, but then again, what's unusual for me might not be unusual for you. Um, seeing bald eagles, uh, there's one on the screen now. I had the experience a few months ago going down into Maryland to photograph bald eagles, and there were over 300 of them. I could count 150 without having to move from where I was standing. Ontario used to be like that. So that would be really cool to see again. But we're certainly seeing bald eagles along Lake Ontario shoreline. And Port Credit is a good place to look for them. Uh, I would suggest you get down there. But for really unusual species, I would enjoy, I would join the uh, Birders Network. It's an online thing and they alert you when they've seen an unusual species. And if you can travel during these times of COVID to go see them, wonderful. If not, uh, I'm sure there's lots of unusual and interesting species just around your backyard. Uh, we've seen here in my house, we had a flicker, which we've never seen before. And we've got two red-bellied woodpeckers. And the red-bellied were interesting because they arrived at Riverwood about, I'm guessing, 10 years ago. And we had a couple. Then we had three or four pairs. And this was because we were feeding. Well, now the red bellies have expanded into our backyard, which is really cool. Oh, and I did see one interesting bird, a white vulture. A white turkey vulture, whitish turkey vulture, has been soaring around the house in the neighborhood. This is in the Riverwood area. I have not gotten a picture of it yet, but it's very unusual to see a turkey vulture with this much white on its wings and its tail. And it is definitely a turkey vulture. It's got that wings bent like that. So maybe if you see that, that'd be kind of cool. That's what a typical turkey vulture looks like. This one looks exactly like that, except paint the wings and the tail white and put a little white on the neck and then throw in a smattering of black. It's, it's a really unusual bird. And I thought it had left on a migration because uh, I first saw it about a month ago, but I saw it again a few days ago. I'm going to get a picture of that bird. I'll post it when I do. And it does look like we have uh, quite a few bird lovers or bird watchers in the audience right now. So a comment from Jonathan. Uh, well, first of all, from Jonathan, I love bird watching. And he follows that up with, my wife, my wife thinks that was a little bonkers. Uh, so Jonathan, not knowing you or your wife, I'm gonna say your wife is wrong. Uh, and that uh, your bird watching is wonderful and should continue. Uh, so please continue with that. Um, and a question now as well from Jonathan. Uh, we'll continue on with him. Uh, can you talk about what's being done to eradicate the Phragmites that are taking over everywhere? Okay, I'm not the expert on uh, Phragmites. That would be uh, Derek Stone. But what I do know is that we've tried cutting them in our pond at Riverwood, and that didn't work. We tried digging them out. That was a lot of work that didn't do much to help them. We tried solarization, which uh, is where you put this black uh, material down on your ground, and it, it worked a little bit, uh, but Phragmites are, are a real problem. I do a lot of photography down in Long Point where they have done a lot of stuff in controlling Phragmites, and it tends to be a chemical uh, that they apply to the area and then they bring in bulldozers and dig them up. At Riverwood, we have plans to redo the pond, and we're going to dredge it out to get rid of the Phragmites, because once the roots get down, 
if you cut them off, the roots just send up other shoots. So that's what we're trying to do at Riverwood. Um, we did uh, some chemical control to try it out. There was a lot of paperwork and hoops to go through with the city and Credit Valley Conservation to do anything along that line. Uh, it was it was pretty tricky. Uh, I mean, it, I'm not sure that it worked. The pond, our pond is still covered with Phragmites. We expect to be dredging. I think we would have done it this year if it wasn't for COVID. So I think probably next winter, um, but for a person, if you've got a few of them, control them as soon as you can. Same with garlic mustard. If you've got them in your garden, get rid of them and throw them in the garbage in, in plastic in garbage bags so that they're incinerated. Don't put them in your uh, recycling. Um, those are the two plants I think most people are going to find in their neighborhood. And okay. by the way, my wife thinks I'm bonkers too. So you're going to you're crowd a lot of people in it. And that, that's a pretty good crowd to be in, uh, of the uh, exceptional bird watchers. Uh, and kind of along those lines, a question from uh, Patricia. Have you been to the Wimbrel Watch at uh, Sam Smith Park, which I believe is in Etobicoke? Hello, Patricia. Good to see you again. Um, I have not. My understanding is that um, I, I've been there in the past. But I haven't been recently. My understanding this year is that um, the park is still closed. Hopefully, John Tory will open it up again. Uh, I suspect, well, I know that there will people be people there doing the Wimbrel Watch. Uh, Wimbrels come through. For those of you that don't know, they're a shorebird with a, a curved beak. They're really lovely, interesting birds to see. They come through, and Sam Smith, which is at the bottom of Kipling Avenue, is this little spit, and this little spit is the first landfall that these Wimbrels make crossing Lake Ontario. And so every year they go out there and they count them. And um, I, I, I've seen a few there, but I haven't seen a lot. But I know that some people go there and see quite a few. The other thing at Sam Smith that's really cool is the loons, because the loons come in and they, they station themselves there until the ice up north melts out and the loons can go nest. So you will see loons, particularly in, I guess, April, along the shores, and you'll hear them flying over, calling, and sometimes they'll come back that night and do it again. I, we assume they come back. I don't know if they're tagged, but it's a really good spot. Um, and the Wimbrel Watch is a popular thing, usually tied into a birding weekend, I think. And Patricia, you would know better than I, but I think it's uh, towards about now. So it's in May, I believe. And uh, the birding events uh, here and in Peely are all canceled, which is really unfortunate. Um, although I do know that we had a birdathon where somebody, I guess the University of Toronto, Mississauga, uh, Mark Johnson was uh, putting some money into uh, supporting Riverwood if they were given the number of birds seen at Riverwood, the number of species seen. So that was kind of interesting. So we'll uh, make a little bit of a jump from birds uh, to a question that we get uh, quite often, which is how many deer live in Mississauga? Again, deer, one of the more common residents uh, of Riverwood. Um, we've been saying for, well, I've been at Riverwood for almost 20 years now, walked it for more than that. We say there are between 20, uh, sorry, 35 and 45 deer. The number has been very consistent. I've been part of a program with UTM where we've been kind of looking at the number of deer and observing them and trying to figure out what's going on with them. And that number has been has held up. There'll be more in a few months, or actually by the end of this month when the twins, the fawns arrive. But by next fall, which is where we're basing the 35 to 45 number on, some of those will have been taken by coyotes. Some of those fawns will have um, trying to move out and been hit by cars and things like that. There's some attrition. So the number stays fairly constant. Um, that's one herd of deer. There's a herd of deer down around Rattray Marsh and the uh, old Suncor plant, which I'm told numbered about 70. And that was information I got from the managers at the Suncor plant. There's another herd of deer over by the airport in the Toko Creek area and I think I think it's around 30 and 
Then there is a herd of deer up in Meadowvale. Um, it's probably around 40 or 50, maybe a bit more. So all told in all of Mississauga, there are probably uh, less than 200 deer uh, by the fall season. Um, the problem, one of the things we're trying to figure out is whether or not these deer communicate. So our deer at Riverwood, we pretty sure go down as far as uh, the marshes down by in Port Credit and go as far up as Streetsville. And then that's all on the Credit River. The Rattray Marsh deer go along the lake shore over to Suncor property. And that's pretty much where they're confined. The Meadowvale deer have a greater leeway of range because they can go further up into the Brampton area. And the Tobacco deer are pretty much confined to an area. We have north-south corridors, the Credit River, the Humber, the Dawn, um, 16 Mile Creek. But we don't have a lot of east-west corridors. So the deer that live in the west in Rattray Marsh, we don't think they breed with the deer that live in Riverwood. We don't think our deer breed with the deer over in Etobicoke or Etobicoke Creek area. One of the things that I would like to see the city establish and uh, is a corridor that goes east to west for wildlife. They've done corridors deliberately in many places, particularly in Alabama, and I think it was Arkansas, for black bears of all things to, to you know, regenerate the population and it worked. Um, but that wasn't through cities. Cities are going to be a little bit tougher. Um, but that's the answer to the question. There's about 200 deer in Mississauga, give or take. And uh, going from deer quickly back to birds, just for one moment, uh, from Aaron, any good resources, uh, books, apps, et cetera, for novice birders that you would recommend? Um, sibling, uh, Sibley books are really good. Uh, Peterson books are really good. Um, I would say I'd start with those ones. National Geographic has a wonderful series from basically their bird guides right up to their bird behavior books. And they are stellar. I, I really recommend them. Stokes um, has a series of books, volume one, two, and three on bird behavior. Um, they're limited because they only cover maybe 100 species, but they're really good books. I find them very helpful when I'm writing about birds. Uh, so I would say National Geographic, Sibley Bird Guides, and there's one to birds and there's one to the behavior and also uh, the Stokes books. So uh, National, they're, they're all good and there's lots more coming. Birding is so popular that there's just all kinds of books. Peterson is putting out guidebooks on owls and guidebooks on hawks and guidebooks on birds that are hard to identify. And uh, they're wonderful books. They may be a bit beyond the beginner, but I can tell you, because I'm bonkers, you can spend hundreds of dollars on bird books. And I know lots of people that do. And uh, there's always something new coming out. And uh, we'll go from uh, the birds to the bees uh, with a question again from Jonathan. Uh, can you speak about bee, bee emoji conservation and the current issues that uh, bees are facing? Um, part of the problem, uh, it's a more complicated problem than we can really probably address completely here. Bumblebee numbers have dropped uh, and they have dropped because of, uh, I think it was a fungus, or maybe it was a mite, one or the other, I may be getting that confused with bats. I think overall the numbers have come back. The problem that a lot of people don't realize is that bumblebees are not a native species. So we were going to put bumblebees on the river where we were gonna set up some hives. And we consulted with a number of people, including beekeepers. And the consensus was we would not do that because we would be competing with the native bees. And there are lots of native bees in Ontario. And even in Riverwood, there's probably two dozen species of native bees. So we made a decision not to 
put honeybee hives in. Honeybees do well where they have large crops, such as wheat, barley, oats, that they can fertilize, and those are the ones that are a concern. So I would say that um, the bee question is uh, a difficult one to really give you a pat answer. I know that the city, the Royal York Hotel, has put up beehives on top of their building. There's many places in the city, and they fit perfectly because there is not as many wild bees living in the city as there are in, say, a natural area. So they are doing better there. Um, you can put a pollinator garden in, which would help. Um, but the question of honeybees is, you know, it's it's an amazing story and it's it has its ups and downs. I, I think it's, my impression is that the problems they were experiencing a few years ago are not as serious as the problems that uh, we may be facing and faced or we're facing now. I think we've gone away from it. I'm thinking too of the other bee that you may have heard, which isn't a bee, it's this giant hornet that's been all over the news. This uh, killer hornet that kills bumblebees or uh, honeybees. Um, there have been, I may be confusing the species name, but there was a giant killer hornet that came into Grand Bend, Ontario about five years ago, I think. I was talking to a researcher at the University of Guelph about this. I mean, it's about that big. It's monstrous. It would scare you. And uh, apparently it preyed on other insects. But it's not established here in Ontario. So you see in the news that this killer hornet has arrived. It, it hasn't just arrived. It's been here before in Canada. It's been here before in the States. But it cannot survive cold winters. And they've died out. But they are huge really scary insects. I wouldn't want to meet them. Um, that's got nothing to do with bees other than that this one species currently feeds on bees. But cold winters do eliminate them. So some good news there. I don't think I really answered your question that thoroughly, but I tried. And uh, the term I believe is murder hornet for the new hornets that are uh, being spotted or people are think, think that they're spotting. Uh, that's the latest concern uh, as we're dealing with uh, another challenge uh, amidst COVID-19. So yes, murder hornets. Uh, let's be on the lookout for that now. Yeah. And uh, we'll get to one last question uh, before we wrap up uh, for today. And some of that kind of you know ties uh, everything together. And you touched on it a little bit earlier, Dave, uh, the issue of climate change. Uh, so how is climate change impacting uh, our wildlife? And I guess specifically in this uh, in Mississauga GTA areas. Well, I'd like to say it's a horror story, um, and probably I should say that because that's what people expect to hear. The truth is, we don't know. We're certainly seeing some major effects. We've got major flooding events. We have the polar vortex coming down, chilling us to the bone, which is due to climate change. There's no question about that. It was warmer than the polar vortex when the polar vortex was here in the Arctic than it was in Southern Ontario. That's weird. So we are seeing the effects. We're seeing insect pests. Uh, we've got you know, Lyme disease coming in. We've got the Texas spotted tick coming in. Uh, we've got uh, Nile virus that's come in. These are all probably a direct result of climate change. So climate change is affecting us in many ways. But in some ways, the dire uh, predictions have not come forth. Now, there has been a drop in the songbird population. There's no question that there are fewer songbirds. And that might in part do, be due to, song, to climate change in the southern part of uh, their migratory range. But one of the things we were really concerned about here is what if these birds come north and they find that the insects have burst out from their cocoons or whatever earlier than expected and have already gone through their stages and are no longer available for food. We haven't seen that happen. Birds have managed to mitigate their migration patterns such a way, remember I was talking about the loons, they fly north and check the food out, they don't or check the lakes out. Well, I think what's happening with some uh, warblers, certainly in Point Pelee, the birds will come across. If there's not food in Point Pelee, they'll go back 
over to the state side, and then they'll come back again. Animals are a little bit better at adapting than we probably think they are. So our bird population, I think, has been adapting fairly well. Now, if I talked to this, if I'd done this talk three weeks ago, I would have said that I've heard from a lot of birders that there are not the number of birds around. They're not seeing them. But it was a cold spring. Now, when I talk to birders, they're saying, isn't it wonderful? Look at all the birds we're seeing. Look at the, the warblers are coming through. This is coming through. The wimbrels are coming through. Um, so there seems to be an ability of species to adapt. And just how that's going to work out is really going to be interesting. Um, the biggest problem, I think, for migratory birds is what's happening in the southern range, where they're still using chemicals like DDT, and they're still doing deforestation like we heard about in the Amazon. Those are big concerns for these birds. Our barn swallows migrate down to the Amazon, to Amazonia. Um, so what can happen to them there to climate change or factors that are changing the climate, like burning the forest, could affect their numbers here. Um, we get a lot of birds, the cardinals, the grosbeaks that do these incredible migrations. Um, some just down to the Gulf of Mexico, some even further, the hummingbirds that fly south. All of these birds are trying to cope with climate change in a, a huge area. But locally, I, can, I don't think we have seen the changes other than, or detrimental effects, other than the arrival of various ticks and diseases that we sure don't want to have, maybe even COVID. Um, so it's a mixed story. Weather-wise, we're experiencing really changes. If you go to Riverwood, the forest is changing. The river valley, which was 50 years ago, 60 years ago, just wheat fields has now become forested since Hurricane Hazel. And now that forest is being flooded out and it's changing. And wetlands are changing and animals are having to adapt. So we've lost species in Riverwood. We've lost spring peepers. We've lost, um, I think, Leopard frogs, great tree frogs for sure, we've lost flying squirrels. We've lost groundhog recently, the last five or six years, although we have seen one. But we've had new species arrive like turkeys and coyotes and possums. So climate change is having an effect, but it's it's an ongoing story. No devastating answers, thank goodness, for wildlife yet. That's good to know. And, uh, you know, we will uh, obviously be monitoring that situation as we go along and doing our part to mitigate uh, the effects of climate change. Before we wrap up, just a few uh, straight comments from people that I wanted to highlight uh, from Lisa. Love the park. Thank you, Lisa. So glad that, that you do and hope that uh, you can uh, and we all can enjoy it as we normally would. Uh, just a reminder that right now our trails are open and they can be accessed by walking into the park but the parking lots at Riverwood remain closed uh, as a result of COVID-19. Uh, again, from Jonathan, thanks, Dave, and a thumbs up. Thank you. Agreed. Thanks for coming. Uh, and from Patricia, great job, both of you. Thank you. Uh, and last one from Cindy, hope to see more live events like these. Thank you. Uh, of course, Cindy, we will have more live events like these. That is the plan. Uh, please keep checking our website at the riverwoodconservancy.org as well as our Facebook page uh, for more information on upcoming live events that we will have. And uh, as I mentioned off the top of the broadcast, uh, we have been affected as everyone has by COVID-19. And so if you have the financial ability to make a donation to help us keep events like this going and keep you connected while you stay at home, of course, we would appreciate the support. You can make a donation at the riverwoodconservancy.org. And so Dave, thank you again for your time and your expertise. Thanks to everyone who took part in our first ever Facebook Live broadcast. Again, we hope to have more soon and keep checking out our website for details on upcoming events. And for now, we'll just leave it at that. Thank you again for joining us. And I guess the last words, Dave. Yeah, and uh, if things go well, we'll see you next Wednesday at the same time, same place. Look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, people, for coming. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Dave. And thanks again to everyone for joining us. Take care.